in my place. It is then this context that I introduce all this very well. Thank you, Dr. Freddy, and good morning, my beautiful spiritual family and my friends. Morning. Joyce, I have my own words of welcome. I feel very full this morning and light it. And I'm standing here looking at you, and you are radiating mm -hmm. that light. You are so very, very beautiful. Welcome those who have returned from Farid. I see one of my teenagers, Xavier, at the back of the floor for blessing, but she. Um, is here with us this morning, just for a while or good? For a year. Oh, lovely. Welcome home. Wow. And all those who have been abroad, just know that it's just so wonderful to have you back. You know what? You never left our hearts, but it's nice to have your body back as well. Special welcome, too, to those who join us in consciousness by listening to us on the World Wide Web. My talk this morning is on how you can be the imperturbable, indefatigable, and undefeatable light of God. So listen up. I learned the secret from one of my favorite authors, Joel Goldsmith, and I'd like to share it with you this morning. It is a simple yet powerful daily practice which will make the world of difference to how you feel and how you deal with every day of your life. It's simple this. Every morning on awakening, before getting out of bed, spend at least five minutes centering yourself in God. Just lie there in the warmth of your bed and center yourself in God. Goldsmith calls it, and I quote, reaching the center of your own being. In other words, feeling at peace with your inner self. And so there you have it. Right at the very beginning of my message is your assignment. assignment. And it's a lovely assignment. I, I've been working with it uh, myself because it's so simple and effortless. Your assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is to spend five minutes with your eyes still closed after awakening morning and center yourself in the God presence of God power that knows the obstacles. I've been working with the idea of light uh, these past few weeks since learning this exercise because I'm going to begin my prison and it's our prison ministry um, this month. I've been going into this prison and working with 15 or so young men who are due for parole within a year, in the next year, and we'll be teaching them how to change their thinking and therefore change their lives. And so, I'm not calling it church, I'm not calling it anything. Um, my good friend, George Young, Junior Young, um, wanted to, to call me a, a, a social activist or something, but I told him no. We just say that I'm a behavioral scientist. I don't even want to be going in as a minister. I just want to be going in as somebody who wishes to shine the light um, in their lives and in their affairs. So I want you to pray with me for that um, as we go into this wonderful, wonderful adventure together. So in the mornings when I lie awake, just upon awakening, I, I, I use an affirmation. Uh, which has been working for me, and I'll share it with you. God as me rises like the morning sun to illumine my world. God as me rises like the morning sun to illumine my world. But you can use any quality of God which appeals to you. And having done this, allow yourself, as Goldsmith puts it, and I quote, to feel the Spirit of God right down to your fingertips. Feel it in your toes. Feel the spirit moving in every part of your body. Unquote. Friends, this simple exercise ensures that you begin your day by establishing yourself in the spirit 
even before you leave the comfort and warmth of your bed in the morning. What time you get up is unimportant. What matters is that there is a period at the beginning of your day in which you silently align yourself with the presence and power that will carry you through your day. Goldsmith also strongly recommends that you pause for 30 or 60 seconds frequently throughout your day to stop the clamor of mind and body and inwardly acknowledge the presence of God. I call these my God breaks. You can take them as often as you like throughout the day. Just pause for a moment and center yourself in the idea that God is right where you are. He writes on that quote, it is not enough to feel the presence of God only once in the course of the day. You must carry the consciousness of the Spirit with you throughout the day. If you stop at frequent intervals to bring God to your conscious remembrance, it becomes a continuing awareness. Unquote. So I want you to try this this week. Are you ready to try this? Five minutes when you awaken, sense yourself in God. And just watch from all of the transformations that take place during the week for you. And drop us a line, an email at templeoflight at cwjamaica.com and let us know what your experience has been. That's templeoflight at cwjamaica.com. You know, friends, we often hear it said that God is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. This means there is no place where the light of God is not shining. Am I right? Absolutely. The experience of darkness, then, is always temporary. And when we experience it, it is a call for us to turn on the light of truth within us. But sometimes, trust me, we can find this easier said than done. You see me? <laughs> for those who do not speak the Jamaican vernacular, do you see me? It means, do you see me? You know, in other words, do you understand me? I find it an interesting phrase, you see me, because it means, are you seeing me? I really exist and I'm saying something. You see me? <laughs> Let us say a problem arises in your life relating to your work, or your finances, or relationships, or health, or how you feel about your spiritual growth. Sometimes it can be all of the above. If this has ever happened with you, then you know what I'm saying. You feel desperately alone. You might even feel abandoned by God, and darkness seems to be your total experience. In times such as these, people have been known to even question God's very existence. If you have had this experience, you might have said to yourself, I'm a fans of my student, and I know that everything is God. So why am I experiencing this darkness? What am I doing or not doing? I do my prayer work, so I shouldn't be, be going through this. And sadly, some people feeling overwhelmed by the darkness stop coming to church. I say sadly because it is precisely during these dark times that we most need of a spiritual community. There's a great story about a, a, a mom, a mother, if you remember my home, trying to get up her, her, get her son up on a Sunday morning. And she said, Will you? Wake up, wake up, get up, bathe and get dressed. It's time for church. No, oh, 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 no, no, no. Will you? Get dressed and go to church. Why don't you want to go to church? Lord, <laughs> give you two reasons. They don't like me, and I don't like them. <laughs> William, wake up and bathe and get dressed and go to church. Why? I'll give you two reasons. First, you're 47 years old. <laughs> and secondly, you're the pastor. <laughs> go through periods like these. And often, although it is hard to fathom, when you are experiencing them, there are indications that powerful transformations are taking place 
in your consciousness. And that's a nice way of looking at it. Next time you'll be really in a dark place. Know it's because it's just before the sunrise in your consciousness. Something wonderful is happening, which is going to just touch your life into even greater holiness and beauty. It works this way. As we discover this path to truth, we learn how to pray affirmatively, and perhaps we also learn how to meditate. And if you don't know how to meditate, I suggest you call the office and make an appointment to come and learn. So you learn to meditate and you establish a regular routine of reading through literature, and you begin to offer daily spiritual practices designed to align us with the pure spirit within us, including pausing for five minutes to set ourselves in spirit at the beginning of the day. So far, so good. Since this sets the stage for great spiritual growth and profound changes for the better in our lives. We know that the purpose of our spiritual practice is to consciously come to know our oneness with God. And once we choose this pathway, we begin a process of transformation which calls for us to release or change those aspects of ourselves that we feel are not aligned with the God qualities we wish to embody. In my own case, I had to work long and diligently on forgiveness and on being judgmental. That was my journey. Some people have to work on eliminating envy or jealousy, or the urge to get even with those they perceive as having injured them. But whatever it is that we need to release, as we sincerely seek the consciousness and recognition of our atonement, make that at one moment, with pure spirit, all that is unlike God in us begins to be sloughed off like so much dead skin, and we are left with a deeper awareness of who and what we truly are, the image and likeness of our life. So if you are going through a period of darkness in your life right now, know with me that what is really happening is that the falsehoods and lies that you have believed about yourself are dying. These are the last days indeed of a consciousness that suggests that you are unworthy and not enough. You come as a complete and perfect package, trailing clouds of glory, out of a consciousness of purity and beauty and truth, which is so awesome and so magnificent that if you could just grasp that for yourself, that you are it. You are how it blesses the world. You are sent on a mission to let your light shine so that where you are, there are no dark places in the consciousness of humanity. What, what an enormous, awesome, mind-blowing mission to have been sent on. I'm in Quran, but I give one of the assignment on Sunday morning time. For those who do not speak in Jamaica, the right kind of that means don't complain when I give you a simple assignment on Sunday. So what has happened when we're feeling that darkness is that we have somehow falsely identified with ideas that are contrary to what is truly real about our pain and our suffering. And what we are experiencing is an identity crisis. Who you are is God. And what you represent is good. You see? And Nami says so, hello. We have it on good authority from none other than the beautiful Jesus. Who in answering those who accused him of blasphemy in John 19, 34, quoted Psalm 82, verse 6 to them, which reads, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. End of that scripture. Who dare tell you anything else? That is the truth of your being. So during your dark times, don't stay away from church, my friends. Call one of our ministers or practitioners so we can pray with you and help you light the lamp of faith which will dispel the darkness. Really, you don't need to do it on your own. 
there's a whole community of people willing to support you on your journey, and we have all been there in varying degrees and at various times. So let's join hands and be there for each other. Let us affirm together, I am the light of my world, and my light always shines in the darkness. Together. I am the light of my world, and my light always shines in the darkness. Friends, you are indeed the light of the world. Say it over and over until its full meaning is embodied by your very soul. Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this great teaching known as Science of Mind, writes in the Science of Mind textbook, page 475, and I quote, There must come a time in our experience when we speak with the conviction that is within us. This conviction of the spiritual universe in which we live is real and powerful. The light cannot be borrowed from another. Each has been furnished with a divine torch whose wick burns from the oil of the eternal, ever-renewing substance of faith in oneself and in others. End of quote. So the amazing thing is that although you cannot borrow the light from another, you can share your light, allowing its radiance to illumine and warm others. In Matthew 5, 14 to 16, Jesus says, and I quote, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it on their bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in their house. And I love this book. Popular, popular. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. <laughs> a story is told by Robert Fulgham, a Unitarian minister and author, about a seminar he once attended in Greece. On the last day of the conference, the discussion leader walked over to the bright light of an open window and looked out. Then he asked if there were any questions. Fulgham laughingly asked him what was the meaning of life. Everyone in the audience laughed and stirred to leave. However, the leader held up his hand to ask for silence and then responded, wait, I will answer your question. I can imagine the groans of people sat back down because you know such a question could take at least the next century to answer. And this was the end of the seminar. But the leader took out his wallet and out of his pocket, out, he took his wallet out of his pocket and removed a small round mirror about the size of a quarter. Then he explained, when I was a small child during World War II, we were very poor and we lived in a remote village. One day on the road, I found the broken pieces of a mirror. A German motorcycle had been wrecked in that place. I tried to find all the pieces and put them together, but it was not possible. So I kept the largest piece, this one. And by scratching it on a stone, I made it wrong. I began to play with it as a toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect a light into dark places where the sun could never shine. It became a game for me to get the light into the most inaccessible places that I could find. I kept the little mirror, and as I grew up, I could take it out at idle moments and continue the challenge of the game. As I became a man, I grew to understand that this was not just a child's game, but a metaphor of what I could do with my life. I came to understand that I am not the source of the light, but light, be it truth or understanding or knowledge, is there. And it will only shine in many dark places if I reflect it. Then he said something so powerful to me. I am a fragment of a mirror whose design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, 
I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the dark places of human hearts, and change some things in some people. Perhaps others seeing it happen will do likewise. This is what I'm about. This is the meaning of my life. End of that story. And as I read it, and that imagery of the, the fragment of the mirror, I, I reflected on my interest in holograms. You know, if you take a hologram, and you take a tiny piece of that picture, that tiny fragment, the tiniest fragment of a hologram, contains the entire picture. And so I thought, wow, I'm a hologram of God. Isn't that just an awesome, awesome thought as well? That you are a fragment of something so awesome and so wonderful. And that you have within you, just as a drop of the ocean has within it. It's not all the ocean, but it has all of the qualities of the ocean. And it just made me feel so worthwhile, valid, valuable, and authentic as a fragment of God's glory. Eric Butterworth, one of our early New Paul luminaries, wrote a like quote At any time, under any circumstances, we can turn on the light. And the infinite energy of love will dissolve darkness, heal broken relationships, and become a veritable protecting presence. Man is a creature of light. When his light is shining brightly in all directions and in all situations, he is imperturbable, indefatigable, and undefeatable. Nothing shall be impossible to him. Let us say, I am imperturbable, indefatigable, and undefeatable. I am imperturbable, indefatigable, and undefeatable. <laughs> I'm a joke. I'm laughing because whenever I gave my mom Daisy of blessed memory, an affirmation which she found too long, too convoluted to, to, to remember, she would say, Adapt me, I said to for the benefit of those who do not speak the Jamaican vernacular, <laughs> adapt your set to means that is exactly what I'm saying. Or sometimes you just say bitter. So please turn to your neighbor and say, you are imperturbable, indefatigable, and undefeatable. And your neighbor will say, adapt your to the dim light in the room? No. You would bring as much light as you possibly could. But if you walk into a room of hostile people, what is your reaction? Normally, you meet their hostility with hostility of your own and walk away saying, what an unfriendly bunch of people. And that's your little. <laughs> but as Butterworth points out, there really is nothing difficult about letting the inner light of our divinity shine. All we need to do is correct our tendency to turn off our light when we face darkness. Begin your day, my friends, by centering yourself in God for at least five minutes before you get out of bed as you affirm, God as me rises like the morning sun to illumine my world. Then take frequent 30-second God breaks throughout the day. Just close your eyes, and as our beloved Sharon Thomas always says, take three deep centering breaths. And just say, right here, right now, I am centered in God's life. Can you say that? Right, right here, here right, right now, now, I am centered in God's life. So please turn to your neighbor and say, you are the light of your world, thank you for shining. You are the light of your world, thank you for shining. Friends, every dark night will come to an end when the realization of your true nature as a light being dawns upon your consciousness and you allow your inner light 
to dissipate the darkness of disbelief, prejudice, and fear. You are the light of your world. Thank you for shining. And as my mom would say,